Good morning. Thank you for joining our security briefing, Cloud Security Executive Simplified. My name is Srijan Talakokula. I'll be your MC today. I look after the enterprise uh, for Northern Region for Trend Micro. Um, for the folks that have joined on 24 platform uh, and experiencing for the first time, a couple of uh, housekeeping notes. So there is a Q&A widget that you can all have access to. So we want to keep this session interactive. So could you please post questions and our team will be answering along the way. And there is a speaker's bio and panelists uh, and all the moderators for today's session. You have their information and the LinkedIn profile. So feel free to connect with them. And also um, there is a, a downloaded uh, resources widget. You will have a lot of useful information and especially the content that we want to uh, covering today. So please feel free to access the content. And as well as there are some feedback forms um, and a survey links. So I'd encourage you to please fill those forms. And um, there's some cool uh, giveaways uh, for folks that are filling those forms. And I'll actually announce a surprise uh, uh, giveaway at the end of my session too. Um, finally, there is a contact us button. So feel free to reach out if there's any questions that you want to discuss. So just kick start, um, I've actually joined Trend Micro myself back in 2009, and I was actually reflecting back on my own personal journey within Trend and the conversation, the security conversations that we were having with uh, customers back in those days were so different to the conversations that we are having right now. Back in 2009, uh, we, were speak we were talking to customers about their challenges of security around virtual service and how can we automate security for virtual service back then. And then if I fast track it to 2012, I think a lot of folks that are in uh, Australia would know that AWS actually launches services uh, in Sydney. And I still remember, it's fresh in my mind, I still remember there were close to around 700 people attending that particular summit. Uh, and if I fast track it to 2019, they had 25,000 people attending uh, over three day period. They had to actually close down registrations. What it actually tells is the um, adoption for public cloud is increasing and Australia is a front runner in embracing cloud. So because of a uh, lot of uh, shifting from existing infrastructure to cloud, obviously there's definitely public cloud offers you flexibility, speed and efficiency. And we are seeing a lot of customers that we speak today are adopting you know, uh, containers, serverless, and they're building nat uh, cloud native applications. With all those, we know there is a you know, unique security challenges that we see. Today, I'm actually very excited to introduce our first speaker, Steve Gorn, who is our Executive Vice President of Network Defense and Hybrid Cloud Security. Steve has been in trend for more than 80, uh, 18 years, and I don't think there's no other qualified person with trend in trend to talk about the you know, comprehensive view of different drivers uh, behind constantly evolving cloud security priorities. And more importantly, he will share his own personal experience of speaking with a lot of uh, customers globally. So Steve, welcome. Thank you for joining our event. And I know it's around 6 p.m. in New Mexico, so I really appreciate your time. Over to you. Thank you, Srijan. Hi, I'm Steve. Yeah, I work for Eva Chen, and I'm the product executive at uh, Trend Micro. And uh, I have probably met a lot of you because I come to Australia a lot. Uh, one of the key reasons isn't just because we do very well in Australia, but also we bought a company recently in Australia called Cloud Conformity. And so we're super, super excited to have both operations and R&D now in the Australia region, uh, mostly out of Sydney. Uh, I'm very excited to uh, have a massive uh, group of people in Sydney, so we're very excited. So anyway, hi again, if I've met you before, if not, uh, hi for the first time. Uh, real quick, before we get into the content, I get asked a lot, how's Trend doing during COVID? Uh, we're actually doing very well. We're a very globally distributed company, so uh, it really hasn't changed our behavior too much. So we we all work from home uh, anyway. Uh, we're also very profitable. We had a very good first half. So uh, we even have business continuity plans that we've updated. A lot of customers have asked for those. So if you'd like to see those, we can certainly provide that to you. So uh, that's it. But we are still all locked down. So every Trend Micro office is closed, except for Australia offices, I think. Um, anyway, I personally 
uh, have been in quarantine for a very long time. So uh, before we start the session, I'm gonna talk about, we're gonna do polling questions during this session. So you'll see a question and you get to vote on your screen what the answer is. So let's do the first polling example. So since I have been in quarantine for so long, uh, I have not left my house. Sorry, I've not been in a building other than my house since March 10th. So I'm on, week, on month four. So the emotional side of quarantine can play tricks on you. So the question, if this was a polling question, would be one, am I now a chunk, meaning I've chosen to eat and feel better that way? A hunk, meaning I've gotten very healthy and I've worked out a lot. Uh, a drunk, I think that's self-explanatory. Am I in a funk, uh, which can happen during COVID, or none of the above? All right, so the reason this is an example of a polling question is because I know Australians pretty well, and I'm very scared of the answer that would come back if I actually asked you this. But let's go to our first polling question to see if this works. So, yeah, by the way, hunk is out. You can see me, so that's, that one's already been uh, disregarded. All right, so here's our first polling question. Which describes your role the best? This is your daily operational role. Are you in security operations? Are you in infrastructure operations? Are you in cloud operations? DevSecOps, governance and compliance? Or it's all the same, we don't really differentiate all these roles, we all do this together. So if you could vote on your screen, uh, we'll take a couple seconds and wait for the results. Go ahead and do that now, please. All right, votes are coming in. Ooh, looking good. Okay, hopefully uh, we have everybody. All right, so I'm gonna push those results to the audience and it looks like uh, it's all the same to us came out with 40%. So we had a lot of shared roles. Uh, fascinating. Second would have been infrastructure operations. Not too many people from dev or cloud ops uh, and a little bit from security. Okay, excellent. All right, so I will try to adjust the content based on the audience and try to do a general purpose uh, description of a bunch of different roles since a lot of you are multi-hat. Okay, all right, well, let's jump into the content. So um, really our topic today is cloud security simplified. So I don't think I need to go through the macro environmental descriptions of the cloud. You're all dealing with this. I think we're really gonna talk a lot today about the exploding set of services uh, as well as the speed of DevOps, right? So those are the ones that we think are the biggest changes, but there are new threats. There's a lot of tools out there um, and, and the decision-making is difficult. We know that. So. Uh, so these are kind of the topics we're going to talk about. So I do get to spend a lot of time with customers and we really strategically is really what I'm going to focus on is what are we investing in when it comes to cloud security. And we really have three strategic use cases. So the first one is called cloud migration. So this is really what the bulk of, of a lot of you have been doing in the last five to 10 years. We have thousands of customers in this specific use case. Uh, it's kind of a bread and butter for trend on the uh, workload security side for cloud. And it's really a description. Cloud migration is I'm moving my applications into the cloud either to shut down data centers or uh, just to, to not have to do all the maintenance and management. Uh, it really ends up being in a hybrid situation. We have customers with 50,000 servers in the cloud and 50,000 on premise, as well as we have customers who have 500 and 500. So really is hybrid cloud. And ultimately the use case is how do I manage security from physical to virtual to cloud um, in one set of uh, experiences? And so we've spent a full decade on this use case. So I wanna, we have a bunch of different scenarios that we could walk through if you're interested in follow on sessions. But one, one highlight I really wanted to focus on on this use case is the cloud user behavior around automation and how important it is that we see our customers being able to manage security at scale in a cloud environment. So when I talk about uh, automation, oftentimes security people will say it's security event workflow automation or SOAR or SIM, right? And it's really what we're finding out that customers that embrace the non-security event workflow uh, in this use case are uh, find as much success or more. And I'm gonna describe what that means. So uh, this is a, a actual customer of Trend Micros. They have about 10,000 servers in the cloud on any given day. Uh, some of those are managed, some of those are not managed. Uh, 
And one time we uh, we were having trouble with performance, and we were like, hey, this isn't that big of a customer for us. Why are we having so much trouble? Uh, and so we kind of looked at the history of the cloud uh, server infrastructure, and it was relatively stable, relatively flat, didn't make much sense. And we said, you know what, this is over a month. Can we see your server count per day? Uh, and so this is an example of this customer's server count per day. So we would see on any given day, they would spin up and destroy somewhere between 500, 1,000, 2,000 servers, right? So if we look in the old model of IT on premise, uh, oftentimes the model would be, hey, when you get a server set up and running, call security and we'll configure it or do that. Well, obviously in this case, people spinning up 2,000 servers a day, we're not gonna have that phone call. So when we talk about automation in this use case, it's really dealing with this. Uh, you know, It's somewhere between infrastructure as code and security as code, which I'll talk a little bit about later, but really dealing with the ephemeral nature of cloud workloads spinning up, spinning down, and particularly talking about that CICD pipeline speed. So now we have companies publishing code every hour or every two hours. Trend Micro, we publish code on deep security product about every four hours. We used to publish every six months, right? So the big difference here is how do you automate security in this environment? And that's probably the biggest barrier we see to a successful security implementation in a cloud server, cloud migration use case. Um, so it, we actually looked across our customer base and we found that by vertical, we see a lot of different uh, behaviors, but really when we're talking about this topic of automation around server uh, capability, I would we call it churn. So what percentage of your server infrastructure do you recycle every day? Uh, and we have customers who are anywhere between zero and 230%. So you know, at the bottom there, you see FinTech, which is uh, financial services, uh, organizations uh, that really are kind of disrupting the big banks. And uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, my wife gave me a uh, flower. All right, so uh, FinTech in general is destroying their entire server infrastructure 2.3 times on average per day. So when we find security trying to break into DevOps and to manage this ephemeral cloud environment, we find that automating this process is the most important. So of our successful cloud customers dealing with this cloud migration use case, we find that uh, being able to deal with this in an automated way without having anybody call anybody or anybody do anything manual is absolutely critical. So you'll see some examples of this in the technical session. And it really is describing a gulf that we see every day in our customer base between DevOps and security. And it's really around the concepts of CI/CD pipeline and automation. So this is an example of the pets versus cattle model. So pets versus cattle, meaning uh, the old IT model, you treat an application as a pet. If it breaks, everybody rallies, you shut everything down, you take care of it, you love your pet, it's very personal. I love my application, it's my pet. Um, but in the cattle world, uh, CI/CD pipelines uh, treat applications as cattle. I have thousands of them. One of them gets sick, I kill it, I send it off uh, to the market and I fire up another cattle and I do whatever I need to do. So they're publishing multiple times a day. Uh, everything is automated, nothing is done manually. And when they look, they give us feedback on security, these DevOps people say security people don't understand the automation I'm dealing with. They aren't API driven, they're not cloud friendly. This is the biggest area of feedback we have in the cloud migration case. Okay, so that's cloud migration. Uh, once again, uh, you know, we have millions of servers in management in that use case. The second one is around cloud native applications. So this is really cycling through all these new tools, Jenkins, Jira, GitHub, Puppet, Chef, uh, moving a ton of cloud workloads, also using cloud storage, S3 buckets, as uh, Microsoft, uh, Azure, Blobs, and now we're starting to see massive adoption of containers and serverless. So the cloud native application use case is, how do you provide security in that environment? As we kind of look at the problem set, um, we really see this relationship between security and DevOps becoming even more important than the cloud migration use case. So to our second poll question, uh, how, did you, how does your organization choose cloud native security tools? cloud native, so this is serverless, containers. So one, do DevOps 
dev and security, they work together on requirements and needs and jointly pick a policy and tools? Or does security publish a security policy and they distribute to the organization and people have to follow it? We run into organizations where actually the cloud teams are in control. The dev teams are in control. They're choosing tools, they're moving at light speed, and they just tell security what they did and security has to incorporate that into the security model. And then lastly, really depends on who has the budget. We hear that a lot, actually. So if you can vote on this polling question, hit your submission. I will wait for the results. And let's see, all right. Results are coming in. Ah, well, I didn't, I actually didn't expect this answer. Looks like, uh, sorry, let me push this results to you. Looks like uh, budget, we do it together, and security is in control are the most popular answers, pretty equally distributed. So that's probably what we see. I, I would actually say in, in cloud native, our customer base, uh, we actually see the DevOps team sometimes being in a little bit more control than their, this survey. So hopefully that means the Australia region uh, has a more secu uh, a mature security model where security has gotten a little bit more of a voice at the table. I, when I ask this question of some organizations, we find that two thirds of security tools are chosen by developers and dev DevOps. So let's walk through that. Let's look at the trade-offs and the feedback we get from our customers on the model, on who's choosing what tool and how are we all managing it. The first use case I wanna do on cloud native is something we call, yes, I can do it. So yes, I can do it use case is that first answer that about a third of you gave, which is we all agree, we sit down, we work on requirements. This is obviously the best security model from a control and governance perspective. Um, and it really does allow the most control. So really what we see when cloud native infrastructure get, it gets introduced is that these teams sit down and they say for workloads, let's use this model and this tool set for containers, maybe completely different approach, different tool set and applications, the same thing. So we actually see in the model where security has a lot of control, everybody's agreed on the tool that they're actually deploying deeper and deeper security curls controls into the cloud native infrastructure. So it's actually great from a control perspective. The feedback we get though from organizations is it's really a lot of tools. They end up choosing a different vendor for workload than containers, different vendor for application, file storage, same problem. And so they're saying, hey, I have a lot of control, but man, there are so many tools. It's so hard to manage. So the first feedback we get is we really like the model, but we'd like uh, a tool reduction. This is too much to manage, uh, both not only ops and runtime, but even uh, vendor management and uh, purchasing, right? Okay, so that's the yes I can use case. The second use case is no I can't. So no I can't meaning dev has chosen tools. And some of you, I think 16% of you said devs, dev chooses their tools. So in this case, we actually, uh, get a more dynamic, flexible requirement. They say, security says, I don't have the ability to dictate which tools and I may not be able to manage them actively. So I kind of need a different model. And so I actually thought I would show this model. It's a little bit technical, um, but it's actually from a partner in Australia who built uh, a business logic flow to help security deal with this I can't use case. So this is a good example of vulnerability and intrusion prevention management. So uh, they basically take their vulnerability scan, they put that into a workflow that says, okay, I've got some security products, I've got a ticketing system and an automation tool. And then they've actually organized their networking and their uh, distribution of those tools, not based on the DevOps feedback, but based on what they can see and what they can't. So in this case, if they can patch it, the tool automatically patch it. Uh, if they can't patch it, but they can get an agent on it, so they can, they somehow got to the DevOps team uh, and delivered a security agent as part of the, the AMI or the stack, then they can go ahead and provide a virtual patch. Uh, in the last case, and we're seeing this a lot, where the, the cloud native infrastructure's decision-making is very distributed. A lot of DevOps teams are just choosing their own tools. Security doesn't even know what's out there. Uh, we're finding that they're setting up network pods or network zones, kind of VPCs, 
where they will drop down a network-based IPS. So in, in our case, that would be a tipping point product, right? So really, uh, when you can't have the control you want or your DevOps teams are pitching or picking their own tools, we're finding that there is a model that you can do where you can stack all the completely unknown infrastructure and just run all the traffic through it. Or if you can reach out and do other uh, higher levels of control, uh, you can actually automate this workflow. So actually seeing a bunch of customers kind of invest in this, particularly in an environment where they can't control the workflow. Um, okay, all right, so that's kind of use case number two in cloud native. All right, so, and really the goal there, the goal there is flexibility, right? So the ability to pick and choose depending on how my organization behaves, which you all had a pretty even distribution of behavior. All right, the third use case around cloud native applications, uh, I do wanna move a little left. So if you look at the environment where you've got, uh, you know, your classic cloud, cloud migration and cloud native tool sets out here, Vulnerabilities are showing up everywhere to include in your CI CD pipeline. So let's talk about that. Once again, we see a big, big disruption here between DevOps thinking and security thinking. And so really the traditional model is uh, DevOps publishes their code and ops has to deal with it, right? So this is, this is kind of where we all came from. Uh, de developers care about development, that's it, right? And so uh, really when we dig into the problems associated with that, I think you've all probably seen this report, it's a NIST report on the cost of doing security at runtime in the right, over in runtime, versus doing it in planning and coding and, and test. So obviously the numbers vary by organization, but you know these are significant differences, 30 times the amount of cost and workflow activities if you're trying to detect and fix something in runtime. Right, so our goal, you know, we do a lot of runtime controls for all of you and for all of our customer base, but our goal really is to move left in this CI CD pipeline to really reduce this cost and effort. So once again, that goes back to the relationship model. So I get this feedback a lot from DevOps teams is, boy, security, they hand me a document. I don't do documents, I don't do policy. I, like how come security doesn't know what my life is like? I have to learn about security as a DevOps person, but I don't see the security teams understanding my tool chain and my process and my automation. They just hand me a control and I got to figure out how to do it. Well, the problem is they do everything automated, right? And so oftentimes when security hands DevOps engineer a document, DevOps is saying, you're asking me to do something manual that in, a, in, a, in an entire process chain where I only do automation. So what we found is the customers that have built the strongest relationships with DevOps, even if DevOps is choosing the tool, we find that if security teams can show up with code, so this is where we would talk about security as code. So scripts written in Pup, Puppet, scripts written in Chef, Terraform templates already written, pre-configured, where they can walk over to DevOps and say, not only do you need to understand the, would I like you to understand the control, but I've written you a script that fits right into your DevOps pipeline, into your Jenkins workflow. I'm telling you the customers that hire developers in security and bring that to DevOps, the relationship with DevOps and security is so much stronger than people who are handing policies and recommendations over the fence. So we see a best practice in really defining a security team that can write code and do scripts as really helping with this cloud native uh, CI CD pipeline problem. Okay, our last use case is around cloud operational excellence. So this is really, I've now got a ton of cloud infrastructure. It's very ephemeral. It's coming in, it's coming out. Uh, I may not be able to communicate with DevOps. How do I deal with that? Well, really, um, you know, the, the problems we hear is really around visibility. So how do I just at least figure out what's out there? How do I deal with that? And so a lot of customers are either dedicating a person or a team around cloud operational excellence. Um, and really it is to solve this problem. So we're seeing the best practices of cloud management and, and Amazon and Azure and Google recommend uh, building some type of cloud operational excellence capability to deal with this. You know, we talk to a lot of customers, they say, I don't, I don't really have the manpower to do that. Um, I'm just gonna try to figure out how to deal with it. And obviously 
anarchy is a form of governance as well. Um, but we really would like to do our third polling question around the philosophical side of not building a cloud operations team. So the question is, say you are participating in outdoor sports and things go badly. Would you rather A, see your death coming, as in a bear attack, or B, not see your death coming, as in shark attack? So if you could go ahead and vote, um, I will move to viewing the results and see where we are. Results are coming in, coming in. All right, so uh, there we go. Now we've got 30% of the attendees. Okay, ah, very, very clear winner. I'm pushing it out to you now. Bear attack. People would much rather see their death coming. So that's what we recommend on cloud ops. Uh, you can stay in denial about managing the visibility of your cloud operations, and you can blame it all on dev, but it sounds like most of you would rather see your death coming. Um, and so we'll talk about some tools that we can use later on uh, to, to see your death coming. All right, okay. All right, that's the last polling question. Okay, so what we have done strategically is we've built a framework called Cloud One. It's a, a cloud security services framework, all SaaS services, uh, built in one platform. Uh, and it really is addressing these three use cases. Uh, so really, uh, you'll you'll uh, be able to go through all the services in detail at a later moment. We're gonna demo and preview three of them today. Uh, but really, just understand there's a number of cloud services, I think we've covered a fair amount of the capability here, um, that help you deal with these three very strategic use cases. So. I want to cycle back a little bit through those. So remember the yes, I can do use case. This is where I can put a security control in the workload, the application, the container, and file storage, right? So in that case, you could use one platform and one tool with Trend Micro to deploy all that very, very specific detailed security into the infrastructure. You can use one place to do that, and you can do that in an automated way. If you're in the I can't use case on the right, where you don't have control, DevOps has chosen the tool, you can set up your security pods, you can set up better visibility. So in that case, you may pick and choose uh, conformity, which, are, which is our cloud posture management you'll hear about later, uh, a, a, a network version of IPS, or you can deploy to the agents where you can, similar to that partner use case from Australia that we described earlier. So once again, the goal is to give you one platform to give you the flexibility to deal with your strategic use cases and all your specific use cases by picking and choosing these services. Uh, and the last thing I wanna highlight is those services, we also enable you to move left into the CI CD pipeline. So this is a good example of our container security model in the CI CD pipeline where you can look at your pipeline and determine vulnerabilities um, see, whether you're giving away secrets, whether you have malware. And so the, the concept here is not only do you have the flexibility at runtime, you now can reduce your costs and show up in an automated way in the CI CD pipeline prior to production. So all of that is built uh, into our Cloud One framework. Um, cloud security simplified is the theme of the day. Cloud One framework for us is the way that Trend Micro has approached these use cases and really how we think we focused on a flexible platform. It's automated wherever, it's API first. We have customers who don't even use the console to manage thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of servers, containers, and applications. And then lastly, it's all in one. You have one vendor to deal with, you have one single sign-on. And so our goal is to help you deal with the flexibility you need um, with one platform in Cloud One. So I want to thank you so much for enabling me to describe our strategy to you today. Um, we are going to go through some specifics. The next scenario will be with our wonderful Cloud Conformity CEO when we purchase Cloud Conformity um, in October. I'm going to hand it to Shrujan today. And if you'd like to learn more about Cloud One, that would be wonderful. Please set up a meeting with us. But I at least wanted to show you the strategic direction of where we've headed based on customer feedback. And hopefully I've shared some best practices with you as well. Anyway, hope to be in Australia someday soon. I'd love to leave my house. Um, and I thank you so much for having me today.
Off to you, Srujan. Fantastic. Thanks, Steve. Appreciate the strategy and the briefing. I think as Steve hinted, um, I know he, he he covered about three use cases, uh, whether the customers are going through the uh, early migration to public cloud or actually building or adopting serverless or containers or building cloud native applications in the cloud. Or again, some of the customers that we speak to are striving for the uh, operational efficiency. So I think the message uh, was pretty simple. It's all automated, flexible, and all in, all in one in single platform. So uh, I know Steve did mention about cloud conformity. Um, I think it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Michael Watts, who's the Vice President for Product Management, uh, Cloud Conformity at Trend Micro. And he will have a fireside chat with uh, Property Exchange Group, David Willett, who is the General Manager, IT Security. And we will discuss in this session, now that we heard the different use cases of the customer journey. I think from a, uh, uh, from a customer perspective, it's always uh, good to hear uh, the good work that David's team are doing at Texa, who are enabling on using a lot of cloud services without compromising security. And you'll also see the collaboration between different teams uh, whether it be DevOps, it be security or operations or IT, so how successfully they are running. So before I pass it on to Michael, I was actually also um, <laughs> reflecting myself on the one of the uh, quarterly business reviews that we are doing for in Q1. So we had majorly two highlights in 2019. And a lot of folks that follow Trend Micro, we had our uh, biggest year in financials in 2019. Um, and the other highlight was for Aussies, I was so proud from a trend micro perspective to invest and to acquire an Australian based company. That's where uh, Michael Watts was a former CEO and the uh, proud owner for Cloud Conformity. Now uh, his team of 70 talented folks are joining Trend Family. So, Michael, welcome and uh, over to you. Thanks, Regan and uh, David, thanks for being here. Looking forward to the discussion today. Um, for those that aren't familiar with PEXA, do you mind just before we get started, giving a brief overview of what PEXA is and, and some of the main business models? Yeah, absolutely. And thanks for having me today, Michael. Uh, yeah, so for those of you listening in today who aren't aware, so PEXA, PEXA stands for Property Exchange Australia, which is a technology platform that was actually homegrown right here in the country which offers uh, an electronic or digital form of uh, property settlements uh, to Australia's $7.1 trillion residential property market. Uh, so that allows for property settlements to occur in real time, replacing a 100-year-old paper-based system, uh, and is currently used by nearly every bank and mortgage lender in the country, uh, as well as uh, about 70% of all lawyers and conveyances across the country as well. Uh, so PEXA at the moment uh, currently helps more than 20,000 Australian families a week settle safely on their home online. Great. So we've probably all used PEXA at some point in the background without even knowing about it. Yeah, absolutely. If you've, uh, if you've purchased property at some point in the last 10 years, especially in Victoria or New South Wales, you've probably settled on PEXA. Nice. So I know that PEX has gone through a fairly um, extensive cloud journey and, and everybody's cloud journey is different. And they're obviously at different stages of maturity. Some organizations choose hybrid cloud, multi-cloud, or, or choose a single cloud vendor. Do you mind giving us an overview of where um, PEX is in its cloud journey? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So it probably helps to understand why we started on our cloud journey. Uh, so given what I kind of just told you about PEX's business, that's, that's grown quite rapidly, especially in the last few years. Uh, so we started on a fairly ambitious and aggressive journey in late 2015 uh, towards a, a full cloud transition. Uh, so given what we do, uh, there was three key drivers that we really had. Uh, we had agility, we had cost, and we had control. Uh, so we were, at the time, we were approaching uh, end of life on a lot of the physical infrastructure that we were running uh, and trying to keep up with capacity demands as the business continued to grow. Uh, and looking at handling capacity during uh, peak load times, uh, which when you're dealing with, you know, commercial property settlement uh, and residential property settlement will often occur or uh, exclusively occur during business hours, uh, also a lot at end of month or end of financial year. Uh, so 
being able to provision the, the capacity we needed to be able to deal with those peak times um, exclusively meant that we were significantly over-provisioned or we were going to be over-provisioned most of the time, uh, potentially putting our budgets way out of control. So it was decided that a 100% a cloud-based approach would give us the ability to be able to up and downscale our environment as desired. Uh, so moving uh, exclusively to AWS. So uh, in that model, only paying for what we need uh, when we need it. Uh, some of the added benefit from a security side is uh, there's, there's a, a quite popular kind of paradigm that's being thrown around at the moment is treating your, your resources as cattle versus pets and all that kind of stuff as well, which was an added benefit. So in the old physical world, uh, all our you know, physical servers and infrastructure, they were our pets. We loved them. If we, if we lost them, it was devastating. Every, the whole family was devastated. Um, however, with upscaling and downscaling, uh, you know, you have the, the you know the cattle approach, which is uh, creating slightly more expendable resources that you can you know blow away as you need to. Not to sorry, sound too dramatic there. Um, <laughs> and, and finally, off the back of that, there's also you know there was a, a very much a desire to move to a DevOps model, uh, you know, modernize uh, our approach in that regards. Um, at the time, all our servers were, were maintained ongoing, which meant we would see configuration drift, which was a problem. Uh, by focusing on DevOps uh, in the cloud model, we could build immutable infrastructure, which ensures no manually made changes will persist, uh, resulting uh, into a configuration that is always known uh, and aligned to the infrastructure code. Uh, so, Michael, where we are now is uh, our platform is actually 100% on AWS. Uh, we, we moved uh, quite quickly over about 12 to 18 months, uh, and there is a very strong security-first mantra that is within the organization, which is agreed to across the whole business uh, and very much driven from our top executive and board, level, uh, board levels of leadership. Great. So you spoke a little bit about how you've had to um embed security into that new cloud process. How much of the people and processes needed to change in line with that cloud adoption, particularly thinking about the, you know, the pets versus cattle approach? Yeah, of course. Well, you know, look, we, we've always had a, a security force at PEXA, uh, probably a slightly smaller one before we embarked on this journey. But uh, as the business grew and we, we moved into the uncharted territories of the cloud, um, you know, trust in our network had always been and continued to be a, a critical success factor for our business as the national e-conveyancing provider and uh, an organization that was disrupting an industry, basically. Mm. Uh, so the decision was made to invest heavily in an internal security team, uh, starting initially with standing up an internal SOC. Uh, so a team of analysts who work within the business, who understand the business, uh, and have that real buy-in to the business to be able to analyze and respond accordingly, as opposed to a, an outsourced SOC at that point in time. Uh, and we've also gone and recruited SMEs and analysts across a number of different uh, functions. I heard in the previous session, you know, it was really important to make sure that you have, um, you know, kind of DevOps uh, style people within your security team. And that's what we've done. Uh, we've brought cloud analysts and sec DevOps uh, individuals into the team to help bridge that gap with the development community. Uh, as well as uh, analysts for network endpoint, uh, we've got our own internal vulnerability testers uh, and functions for for governance and and architecture as well, uh, ensuring that you know security team members are ingrained at all levels of the business uh, and the development cycles from um, design right through to operations. Great, and I always love to hear about organisations adopting DevOps and you know, embedding security early in the process and making sure that it's across all parts of uh, the different teams that are administering cloud. There's a big um, focus at the moment around and the buzzword DevSecOps and, you know, shifting a security left. Is that something that um, PEX is adopting? And if so, how? Yeah, yeah. well, I think we, we often hear people talking about, you know, making sure that you've got people, processes and technology as part of your strategy and your roadmap. Um, and look, we've certainly provided the technology. Uh, you know, we've got we've got code scanners, vulnerability scanners, the, you know, the, the the chip box items that you're supposed to have. Um, but we also we, we like to really focus on the people side of things uh, because in in this kind of world and climate, the people become your biggest strength in this space. Mm. So I often like to talk about how you think about uh, 
security awareness training for your corporate users, right? You're always, you're constantly challenging them on how to detect email phishing and manage their passwords and all that kind of stuff. Uh, security awareness also plays a real heavy role in what you're doing with your engineering and developer communities. Um, so to that end, our security team is really actively involved in the, the DevOps lifecycle. So making sure that we're kind of like right in the middle, um, assisting with code before it's published. Um, and we're not just a team that's providing rules and tool sets to define the boundaries of, of how the devs have to work and, you know, um, you know, you can't move outside of this. Again, it was, you know, like mentioned in the previous session, we don't, whilst we do have standards and guidelines published for how you should do certain things with, within the cloud, you know, how you need to configure your S3 buckets, how your APIs need to be configured, all that kind of stuff. Um, we really have worked to make sure that we have more of a liaison work to create more awareness around the impacts of security issues uh, within that sec DevOps life, life cycle. So providing feedback on uh, the various vulnerability and pen tests that we do, both with our internal team and externally for our requirements. So making sure that there's a, an understanding of the impact of what certain vulnerabilities could be if they are actually you know, published into production. Um, and you know, so making sure that we really kind of educate our devs and engineers on you know, how how they can um, address common vulnerabilities or even stop common common vulnerabilities from even kind of getting into production in the first place. Because if you help enable them to be able to, uh, you know, to have that security notes and work better, um, they're not always reliant on availability of the security team. And if they've got, if they've got the security team ingrained with them, everything becomes much, much easier. Um, and it enables us to stop those defects from even coming up in the first place. Great, and I'm, I'm noticing that's a really common theme, which is awesome to see across the market that uh, security is moving away from that at least traditional misconception of it's a blocker and I just need to get the rubber stamp from security to get my application or code into production. And now it's really an enabler and making sure that everyone understands why it's important and really giving them the tools and the knowledge to actually be able to do these things themselves. So you mentioned earlier about you've stood up a, a SOC. How does the, the Security Operations Center play a part in uh, that end-to-end -end, um, security in the cloud? Yeah, absolutely. It's 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 actually been quite critical for us, and the SOC has become that that pivot point of not only the security team but the security across the whole organization. So, I mean, yes, we all know that SOC does uh, you know uh, monitoring and detection, uh, but we also provide resources to. Uh, help make sure that our resources and workloads are isolated from each other as they can possibly be, you know, the reducing the blast radius. Um, and we've been starting to build uh, guidelines and, and tools in that help alert the SOC to uh, various misconfigurations against our, our chosen frameworks like uh, NIST cybersecurity framework and ISO 2701 um, to make sure that cloud resources are configured to communicate with each other, um, you know, only in the way that they need to. Uh, we are trying to look at you know, how we how we automate that detection as best we can, and also so also auto remediate as best we can. But there's still a lot of a lot of manual work and manual review of config that kind of goes on at the moment. It's a little bit like uh, painting the Sydney Harbour Bridge. You kind of go through all the config once, and then we got to come back to the beginning and start again. Um, but it's really 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 important that we don't kind of rest on our laurels in regards to that because if We've been seeing a lot of reports come out for you know various data breach investigation reviews and what have you for 2019 that show that uh, compromise uh, or cyber compromise as a result of misconfigurations or avoidable misconfigurations in the cloud are very much on the rise. Mm. Uh, so I, I believe one of the last figures I saw, Michael, was something around about 20% of uh, all all compromises in the last year were the result of these avoidable misconfigurations. So we've tried to build alerts into our team for some of the, you know, the non-negotiables, um, as you absolutely should have. So things like something like SSH open to the world. Everyone knows that, you know, you should not be allowing that. Um, so we've built in alerts for that and starting to look at auto remediation where possible. Now, auto remediation is one of these holy grail things that comes up a lot in, in stock. Um, it's, you know, we all should be doing it. I know I've been going to conferences for years now where they've been telling me like, yes, auto remediation is the future, but it really becomes a too hard basket because it can be very disruptive to business operations if your auto remediation kind of switches something off that it shouldn't. Um, 
So we're trying to take that out of the too hard basket where we can, you know, with you know, SSH open to the world, as I mentioned before, um, and trying to pick off the, the things that we can and just make it. And that's what I would say to people listening today, with stuff like that, where it's too hard, try to make a start wherever you can. Um, other things like, um, you know, file and configuration monitoring in place and being constantly mature to make sure that we question major changes to make sure they're linked to approved mm. programs that work. And underpinning this, and probably one of the most important things, is your, you know, well, for us, our logging standards. Uh, making sure that we have baseline logging standards across uh, the whole infrastructure uh, and that we're collecting and uh, storing everything in terms of logs. Uh, even if we're not actively looking at it, uh, it's much better to have those logs stored in the event of a compromise so that you can reference them, and even if you don't have like any kind of correlation rule going over them. Um, than to not have them at all. Absolutely, and I, I think that auto remediation point that you made earlier um, is quite topical at the moment. A lot of organisations will try and they think about auto remediation as a big bang approach. How am I going to do this? But actually, using those logical starting points and use cases that at an organisational level have been in place for for quite some time are, are a great way to get started. Um, we're almost out of time, but um, just a final question and knowing that the cloud isn't set and forget, and it seems like PEXA is pretty mature in the way that they've constructed their, their cloud and orchestrate the management. What are some of the initiatives over the next 12 to 18 months that um, PEX is looking to, to undertake? Yeah, well, we're into year two of a, of a bit of a three year journey at the moment um, to, to move us away from being more delivery focused to operations focused and more proactive as opposed to reactive, um, that old thing. Um, but really <laughs> the main items that are kind of, that are on our roadmap right now are what I've already talked about. Um, so getting, um, getting, getting those logging standards locked down and making sure that we're getting every single log that we need to get. Um, and moving towards um, you know, alerting on config um, or misconfigurations and really starting mm -hmm. to push that auto remediation territory. Those are some of our really, really big focuses uh, as in the coming months. Excellent. Well, David, thank you so much for your time and sharing PEX's journey. Uh, I'm sure that was very insightful and um, um, going to be very useful. Surajan, back to you. Thanks for having me, Michael. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.
much, Surujan, and uh, thank you everyone for joining. My name is Andrew McClellan, and I am the director of cloud here at Ten Micro. And uh, the absolute best part about my job is I get to travel all over the country. Well, I did get to travel. I now tend to Zoom or Chime across the country talking to organisations around cloud security. And I did log in and look at the registrations, and we do have people from, from all over. We've got people in Perth, all over here here to the east coast of Australia, over to New Zealand, and even down to the bottom of the South Island in Invercargill. So thank you so much for joining. It was great hearing from Steve talking around some of the, the key strategic priorities for cloud builders and also some of the use cases for Cloud One. And then hearing from Michael and David on how to build security into cloud operations. Now we're going to take a look at some of the key challenges facing organisations with cloud security. And to do so, I'm joined on stage, albeit a, a virtual stage, by three of our incredible sales engineers. First of all, Alex German. Alex is a very passionate Swan supporter and recently joined the team in the conformity side of the business and brings a wealth of knowledge, particularly around compliance and in the banking and finance sector, not just in Australia, but also across Europe and North America. Hey, Alex, how are you? I'm doing really well. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks for having me. Great. Next up is Dominic Biddlecombe. Dom is one of our most senior sales engineers with over 20 years experience in, in security. And whilst Dom is certified across the entire Trend Micro portfolio, he really does focus in on cloud security. And, and there are people who suggest Dom's forgotten more about cloud security than a lot of people know. Hey, Dom, how are you? Okay, Dom must be joining us shortly, so I'll go, I'll skip over to our resident in-house DevOps guru, Will Robinson. How are you, Will? Good, thanks, Andrew. Great. And and when Will's not with me presenting on Cloud One and talking to organisations, he's authoring his blog, oznetnerd.com, and I think it's in his bio. He's had nearly a million, so the 900,000 page views. That's fantastic. As I said, um, we're going to look at some of the some of the key challenges facing organisations. And, and when I'm out there with customers and partners, I hear a very clear, consistent commentary around some of these challenges. And the first one I like to refer to as the rise and rise of misconfiguration and the challenges that brings for security teams. Alex, when you look at that challenge of misconfiguration and the pace at which infrastructure, cloud infrastructure can move, and the agility and speed that engineers can work. How can security teams stay on top of that? Yeah, you're right. It, it's definitely something that we're hearing um, in our conversations with customers that um, it's a, it is a struggle to keep up with how quickly that their infrastructure builders can move now. And what I'm saying to these customers is I really think there should be a um, honing in on the controls around the cloud infrastructure and making sure it's secure by design and built to best practice. In a traditional waterfall infrastructure project, security might be engaged around this design phase and um, trying to ensure that the security policy is met through you know, passing the design through an architecture review process. But in the world of cloud and DevOps with CI/CD pipelines, where infrastructure can be written as code, that traditional model can get in the way of the agility and the speed that cloud enables. So a cloud security posture management tool like Trends Conformity is really the answer to continuous real-time monitoring of cloud infrastructure and to provide that assurance that the workloads are built securely and to best practice. In doing this, our customers have really been able to establish a strong foundation for their applications and their data to live and operate. Um, conformity's value lies in this comprehensive set of rules and checks that are built off the benchmarks that have been set by AWS's well-architected framework and also by um, the Azure CIS benchmark, along with a whole bunch of industry standards and frameworks that you'd be familiar with, like ISO 27001, NIST, SOC, et cetera. And these rules and checks give security teams the visibility that they've previously lacked in being able to identify and prioritise these misconfigurations within their cloud environments, particularly those that create security vulnerabilities to their applications and their data. 
The depth and breadth of the coverage of this rule set is really what gives assurance to security teams that they can identify risks within their environment and have them remediated. The coverage is across all the traditional infrastructure as a service components, but also extends to PaaS and SaaS um, offerings from the cloud providers. And what, what brings the most significance to the security teams that I talk to is conformity's ability to do all of this in a way that's completely automated, always on and in real time. And this real time, always on monitoring capability um, is really, really effective, but most effective when it integrates into the tool set that an organization already uses. So being able to rely on the communication channels like Slack and Teams, um, ticketing systems like ServiceNow and, and Jira and SIEM platforms like Splunk means that you can trust not only that these misconfigurations are being captured, but that they also can be actioned by the appropriate team really rapidly in a channel that the teams are used to seeing and that have eyes on glass throughout the day. But what really takes this to the next level and pushes beyond just being a reactive control and providing a detective capability is conformity's ability to provide a knowledge base that is so strong and really differentiates us from um, you know, the others in the market in providing rationale around um, the misconfiguration and step-by-step -step guides on how to remediate it, um, both within a console and in the command line interface. Conformity can also take this into a proactive approach and correct and prevent the introduction of these misconfigurations or infrastructure that doesn't meet security policy with something we call auto remediation. And it was mentioned before, and this really eliminates any ve vector for attack on the misconfigured infrastructure by handling that correction without any human intervention and in near real time. So what you can see on the screen is conformity is able to identify me spinning up a bucket in um, AWS, has identified that the policy um, has been misconfigured and has risky um, public um, read access and is able to handle within a few, within minutes, the correction of that policy and secure that bucket without me having to do anything. Thing. And it, as well as being um, corrective in that a proactive approach, conformity can also be um, uh, preventative from a standpoint that this, temp this template scanner can um, provide a capability that enables our customers to shift security left and run their infrastructure as code templates through a best practice assessment and identify um, misconfigurations before they're even deployed into the environment. So this um, assessment has been baked into the CI/CD pipelines of our customers at various um, stages and introduced a real DevSecOps culture into how engineers and architects build that cloud environment. So putting this holistic, detective, corrective and preventative control in place has really gone a long way to ensuring our customers build and maintain infrastructure that meets both best practice and also their individual security policy. Hey, great. Thanks, Alex. And I love how you mentioned compliance, which is another key challenge organisations are facing. How are you seeing customers adapt to the demand of auditors as they move workloads into the cloud? Yeah, you're right. It really is a challenge um, for organisations in adjusting to a more substantial landscape in which their infrastructure lives. You know, gone are the days of having just a primary and secondary data center. Now customers have the ability to spin up infrastructure really anywhere in the world at the click of a button. So the agility that's afforded by the nature of cloud infrastructure comes with it the challenge of being able to handle the obligations of auditors and regulatory bodies in the context of public cloud. And what conformity has been able to do for these customers in this space is break down the barriers of a multi-account, multi-region, multi-cloud infrastructure um, or architecture that so many of our customers have and deliver this seamless consolidated dashboard that's continuously monitoring and reporting on their compliance status of their entire cloud environment. 
you know, built into the rule set that I spoke about before is this ever-growing list of standards and frameworks, meaning within a few simple clicks, you can produce an up-to-date and objective evidence-backed report on your compliance status to any of these standards as well as any of your own custom reporting. And that objective evidence-backed um, report is really what um, gives so much power to the, um, the compliance teams, but also the security and the infrastructure teams that it's, you know, it really is a few simple clicks. And what you're seeing on screen is me doing that in, in a few minutes rather than days, weeks, months that our customers might be used to. This functionality has been invaluable to our customers, especially those in the heavily regulated financial services and government sectors, not only to just report, um, produce this report or this evidence to auditors as they require it, but also to give an ongoing assessment and improvement to their scoring throughout the year. And this proactive approach to compliance in the cloud has really proven to go a long way in reducing the burden on organisations that we work with to achieve, but also maintain their compliance status. Fantastic. Thanks, Alex. And it's great to see how can really help security teams stay on top of misconfigurations, but also really simplify compliance and auditing. Now, I believe uh, we've had Dominic Biddlecombe join us. Hey, Dom, how are you? Good morning, Andrew. I'm very well, thank you. That's great. Dom, you and I talk to customers regularly about visibility and automation. They want visibility as workloads spin up, but also truly want to be able to automate security within. How can workload security help organisations with that? Yeah, Andrew, those are, those are really great questions. And really to answer that, I would, I would like to highlight three points here. Uh, firstly, Cloud One workload security provides simple, reusable deployment scripts and event-based tasks, uh, which allow security to be baked into your orchestration tools such as SCCM, Chef, Puppet, Ansible, and so forth and allow for server workloads to automatically be provisioned with your desired security level and then be seamlessly integrated into the workload security manager, which then provides that single pane of glass across your, uh, your entire server environment. Uh, secondly, recommendation scans allow for the automation of the relevant rule sets to automatically be implemented onto your workloads ensuring a lightweight, efficient agent, which only contains the requisite rules required per individual server. And then thirdly, uh, a fully capable RESTful API allows for security to become part of your DevOps environment, uh, ensuring that security can automatically be baked into your environment early on in the build pipeline. And my demo today uh, will demonstrate how we can automate the deployment of security policies onto dynamic workloads within your cloud environment. Um, but as a precursor to my demo, I wanted to have a quick look at the technology landscape. You know, as this landscape evolves and continues to evolve for that matter, uh, we are seeing a rapid uptake and migration towards cloud adoption and, and the surrounding services. Uh, and this has been even further accelerated in the last couple of months as the world moves towards a new norm of working from home. However, this move to the cloud, even if done as part of a normal cloud migration strategy, presents new security challenges. In terms of a platform, uh, the cloud presents or provides a wealth of new services intended to make life easier. However, they may present uh, unique security challenges that we haven't that we haven't considered before. Right? For example, if we use a feature like auto scaling groups, how can we automate security onto any new members of a scaling out process? So I'm going to highlight today how to automate the implementation of security as we move to the cloud allowing for security to integrate into the build process and be baked into the provisioning and scaling of workloads in the cloud. Uh, for this, I will be showing a demo of how Cloud One workload security together with AWS can automate the provisioning and implementation of security when using auto scaling groups. And these same methods will work in other cloud providers as well.
waiting for the demo to start. Uh, to set the scene, I have created a simple uh, a simple auto scaling group uh, in AWS, and we'll be simulating an increase in demand to our servers, uh, which will then trigger a scaling out process and automatically add new servers to the auto scaling group from a base AMI. Uh, the aim is to show that as new servers are created and added to the cloud footprint, that workload security. Uh, can automatically add protection onto these new servers when they are created. A typical use case may be uh, you have a website that needs to spin up additional nodes as web traffic increases, and I will be automating, uh, automating the implementation of anti-malware as well as the IPS module, which as part of the installation will automatically scan each new server and implement any requisite patches that are required by way of a virtual patch, ensuring that these new servers remain free from malware and network-based exploits whilst they are in operation. Workload security can be accessed from the single sign-on within the Cloud One dashboard. So I will log into the Workload Security Manager console, uh, as well as highlight the current AWS server footprint, which is currently two web servers, which are part of uh, the auto scaling group as shown within the auto scaling group configuration. In terms of configuration, I've set the scaling parameters to add additional nodes as load increases up to a maximum of five servers. This will obviously vary based on your specific requirements. Uh, back in the Cloud One console, I'm going to open uh, the policy that I previously created and have already applied to the two servers that are currently serving the web traffic and are part of the auto scaling group. Uh, as part of the policy configuration, I have enabled the anti-malware and IPS modules, and we'll use this policy to automatically apply the same configurations across my new members of the auto scaling group as soon as they get introduced into the environment. The benefit of using policies is that if I needed to add any additional protection mechanisms, for instance, I could simply modify the policy, which would then in turn automatically reflect on all servers that use that policy. Uh, within the IPS module itself, I have set the IPS behavior to, uh, to prevent. I could also set the engine to detect if I only wanted to be alerted to any rule violations without actually blocking any traffic. I've also set the module to automatically implement recommendation scans. So when the IPS module scans the operating system, scans the applications, it can automatically add rules as needed. And this is an ongoing process every 24 hours. So we have a dynamic automated method of adding and removing of network-based patches, depending on what stage the servers are at in terms of their patching cycles. Um, additionally, I have added an event-based task which I'll open now. And this will then automatically assign a policy to any new servers based upon an AWS tag. And I will assign this particular tag to new members of the auto scaling group. Uh, this method makes it simple to take an action based on workload security's knowledge of our cloud environment, which is made possible through our cloud connectors, which integrate to various cloud platforms, including AWS, GCP, as well as Azure. So using this method, you can have servers spread around multiple AWS accounts, but by referencing a common tag, these servers can all be enabled with a common security rule set. Uh, and within the auto scaling group uh, itself, uh, we'll be able to see the tag to be assigned to new members that may be added as part of the scaling out process. These will in turn be seen within the workload security environments and the event based task can proceed to assign the selected policy. So now I'm going to simulate an increase in demand uh, on one of the current members of the auto scaling group with the aim of creating a scale out event, which means that new nodes will be added to accommodate the increase in load. I will do this by using an open source tool called Siege and simulating an additional 5,000 web connections, which will then trigger the scaling out process. And very quickly, uh, we will see additional servers being added to the auto scaling group up to a maximum server count of five, which if you remember is what I set as part of the configuration. 
And if we go over to the EC2 dashboard, you'll be able to see these servers coming online and being created as well. And as previously mentioned, I have set the maximum number of servers to five, which I would expect to see reached given the sudden increase in connections. And then after a short interval, uh, we can now see that all new members of the auto-scaling group are online and in a healthy state, meaning that web connections can now be spread across more servers, thereby reducing the load on individual instances. Now, if we look at the Workload Security Manager, we can see all of these new servers are being automatically added to the console, as well as been assigned the specified policy, thereby inheriting all of the settings within that policy. It will also kick off an automated IPS recommendation scan and add any additional patches needed. So now all servers are being managed and protected by Workload Security. If we have a look at the details of an individual server, uh, we can see that the anti-malware and IPS modules are enabled as per the policy. And if we have a closer look at the IPS module, we can see that 17 rules have automatically been assigned to the server. And as this is a web server, we would expect to see many rules around typical web server protection, such as SSL. Uh, your recommendation scans assist in implementing only the patches and rules required per individual server, ensuring a lightweight and efficient manner of implementing IPS rules across your entire server environment. Um, so that short demo really shows how simple it is to automatically assign policies and protection to newly created servers as part of workload security. This method can be used in multiple different scenarios and configurations to allow seamless automated security for server workloads. Great, thanks, Dom, and uh, great you're hearing you talk about virtual patching. You know, virtual patching is important at the, the best of times or possibly the worst of times, whichever way you want to look at it. Um, and it's not every day your very own Prime Minister is out talking about patching. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's certainly relevant in, in the current landscape, and certainly of late, we've heard a lot about it in the news. You know, we always say patching is difficult, but it doesn't need to be. Challenges with patching that we see often from customers include uh, they're often hesitant to apply emergency patches because of factors such as server reboots and the possible impact on the other applications on the servers. And another factor may be legacy servers, which a lot of organizations continue to use and are, of course, out of support from the vendor. So virtual patching addresses these issues by ensuring that network-based exploits can be blocked whilst allowing organizations to plan their patching cycles at a time that really best suits them, as well as continuing to provide support for those legacy operating systems uh, you know, thereby expanding the useful lifetime of these systems whilst still remaining secure. Come on, Dom, you're not telling me people are still running legacy operating systems, are you? Well, Andrew, on an almost weekly basis, we encounter customers, large and small, who still have legacy systems, which, you know, may be running an old application, or they really haven't simply gotten around to upgrading. And by utilizing workload security and virtual patching, uh, these systems can continue to be used until they are able to be upgraded and they're able to migrate those legacy applications on those systems, providing yet another compelling reason uh, to use Cloud One workload security. Great, thanks, Tom. It was great hearing about how workload security can really simplify and automate security in the cloud. Great, thank you, Andrew. Now I'm going to bring in my my main partner in crime, Will Robinson. How are you, Will? Good, thanks, Andrew. Um, Will, you and I are talking to organisations on a daily basis around cloud security, and and quite often the conversation will lead to how to get more value out of their cloud investment, and that leads towards starting to utilise cloud native services to build and deploy applications, for example. Now, utilising these new cloud services does really open up some new attack vectors. How can application security help organisations stay protected where traditional security techniques may not apply? 
Sure, Andrew. It's a great, a great question because when we're talking about things like microservices, whether it be containerized or serverless, uh, often our cloud providers are administering that operating system. So traditional security, agent-based security, no longer can uh, can work in these sorts of uh, situations. Again, because we don't have access to that underlying operating system. But before I dive any deeper into microservice protection and the like, I first want to ask the audience a question. So in your opinion, who is responsible for serverless application security? Is it both the customer and cloud providers, the customers only, given that it's their application, so we're responsible for protecting it, cloud providers only, it's, the only, it's one of the major benefits of serverless, or finally, they don't need to be secured because they're ephemeral, meaning that they come and they go as soon as uh, they're required. I'll pause here for a couple of questions uh, for a couple of seconds so we can uh, have uh, the audience answer those questions. Okay, let's have a look at the uh, the results. Okay, both customers and cloud providers is the uh, the major winner, which uh, is correct, and that's what the uh, shared responsibility model is all about. The cloud providers will take care of the underlying operating system, but it's us as customers or users that we need to do. We may need to make sure that our code is secure, which is where application security comes into play. So this is what a microservices architecture looks like. What we have is miniature applications. Now, the main thing that I want to direct your attention to is the REST API that sits in front of our microservice applications. What this is, is basically a web server. So for each of our individual microservices, we have a web server. Now, the reason why I want to make this distinction is because when we talk about web servers, we need to think about OWASP-style vulnerabilities and attacks, such as SQL injections, security misconfigurations, vulnerable components, meaning source code that we write or third-party source code that we import into our application, and finally, broken access control. Now, the, as, as I mentioned earlier in my talk, the interesting thing about this when we talk about microservices is that if we're using something like Fargate or Lambda, AWS is taking care of that underlying operating system. So we can't rely on our traditional, traditional agent-based security. And that's where Tremicro's Cloud One application security comes into play. What it is, is a RASP, a runtime application self-protection tool. The way in which it's instrumented is an import statement inside of our source code. And now because it's inside of our source code, we don't need any access to that underlying operating system. And furthermore, we have security traveling with our application. So it doesn't matter if we're running in AWS, GCP, Azure, on-prem, wherever, our security goes with our application. And that's where the application self-protection comes into play because we're now helping the apps to protect themselves. Furthermore, because we're inside of the app, we're a lot more precise than your edge-based security, such as WAFs and firewalls that are sitting at the edge trying to know or, or allow uh, traffic into our application. By being inside the app, we know what should be allowed and what should be disallowed, and therefore, we're a lot more precise and accurate than edge-based solutions. Finally, and again, because we're inside of the source code, we're able to provide customers with a stack trace. So as we'll see in a moment, if someone, if a nefarious actor comes in with an SQL injection, we'll know, not only protect and prevent that SQL injection, we'll also tell the security team and application team exactly where, they're down to the line of code, where they're vulnerable to that SQL injection attack. So I'll be doing a demo in a moment, uh, and in this demo, we'll be playing both a part of the nefarious actor as well as the defender. Okay, I'll just pause for a moment while the demo comes up. Okay, so here is my Lambda function with an API gateway sitting at the front of it. First, what I'll do is use the application legitimately. I'll put my name in there and the application will say hello to me. Excellent, it works as expected. Now what happens if I put a directory traversal attack in there? What I've done here is I've fooled the Lambda into giving me its environment's variable file. In that environment's variable file is its API credentials, which I can now use as a nefarious actor to mimic or, or gain access to that AWS account with all the exact same permissions as that Lambda has. 
at worst, or sorry, at best, maybe I've got access to some S3 buckets and a DB. At worst, for, for the the, the uh, victim, they may not have locked down their uh, their role for the Lambda, and now I potentially have full admin access to their entire AWS account. Now, how do we go about protecting this uh, function from uh, being attacked in, in such a way? We jump into application security, we create a new group, and we get our application security API keys. We jump into our Lambda, and we pass in our application security uh, API keys as environment variable files, as environment variables, sorry. We save our new environment variables, and we simply import the application security library into our source code. No re-architecture of our application is required, simply the import statements and the declaration of our Lambda function, and that's it. We save the Lambda, and then we re-attempt the attack. Now, application security by default is in report mode. So although the attack will be successful again this time around, what we'll see is that we're able to get a lot of visibility from that attack. We jump back into application security. We can see that we're under attack. But this time around, we have a lot more details. So for example, we have that it was a Lambda function that it was attacked. We have the attacker's IP address. We have all the related AWS details, ARNs, uh, transaction IDs, so on and so forth. Furthermore, we have the type of attack and what was attacked, our environment's variable file. Finally, what we have is the stack trace. We see here that on line 13, we have a vulnerable code. We jump back into the Lambda and we can see that we're the code that we've written simply reads whatever file the, the customers put in there or nefarious actors put in there, we read that file and present it back to them. So now we we're able to close out that issue. However, let's jump back into application security, literally just flick a switch, and now our intentionally uh, vulnerable Lambda is extremely secure. So we jump back into our vulnerable application, we re-attempt the attack, and we're blocked. So again, just to reiterate, it's quite fascinating how simple it is to uh, protect our latest and greatest serverless and containerized functions or applications simply with an import statement of our security library and the passing in of our environment's variable file, the environment, environment variables. Uh, over to you, Andrew. Great, thanks, Will. And and certainly, application security is one of the services of Cloud One that really gets cloud builders excited. So, thank you very much. I'd also like to thank Dom and Alex as well for joining us as we discuss some of the key challenges facing cloud builders. With Dom, with Dom, we spoke about how visibility and automating security can be done via workload security. With Alex, we looked at misconfiguration and compliance and how it can be handled with conformity. And just then with Will, we spoke about how in the brave new world of serverless, application security can keep companies secure. Now, as Steve mentioned earlier in today, there are also some additional services within Cloud One, such as file storage, which can help vulnerabilities in cloud storage. Network security can scan, scan traffic coming in and out of your environment at speed, which has always been a challenge in a cloud world and container image security where you can build security into your CI CD pipeline and shift security left. Now, as I pass back to Surujan, if I could just leave you with three key takeaways about Cloud One. Firstly, it's a flexible platform, whether that be flexibility from a multi cloud or a hybrid cloud or a multi operating system. It's an API first platform that helps automate cloud security. And it's all in one that enables you with tool reduction and can secure you no matter where you are in your cloud journey. Now, Surujan, as I, I pass back to you, um, we've spoken a lot about Cloud One today, obviously, but we've also got our XDR platform. Where does Cloud One and XDR work? Fantastic. Thank you, Andrew. Um, again, I think the story all today from the three speaker sessions was in line with the offerings that Trend Micro Cloud One platform will give you as automated, flexible, all-in-one. With the uh, 
I mean, recently, with, with, in the last one, one and a half year, we were speaking to a lot of enterprise customers. And one thing that constantly uh, that we hear is uh, customers that are seeking detection and response across the endpoint and the cloud workloads too. So uh, with the detection, with the XDR story from Trend Micro, so we, ha we normally take all the telemetry from your existing uh, data centers, be, be virtual and taking the telemetry from your cloud and containers across different platforms, then give you access to a SaaS-based workbench that you can do your own investigations and threat hunting. Um, if you want, uh, if you're low on resources, then we can rely on Trend Micro 24 by seven uh, managed security offering, wherein we will do the threat hunting for you. So quite recently, um, Gartner has predicted their 2020 predictions on XDR. So X, what is XDR? A lot of organizations might have already heard about uh, detection and response across endpoint. That's been there from last two, three years. But uh, XDR will give you a overall view, detection and response across your endpoint security, email security, network security, and cloud workload security. So having the complete visibility of threat is critical in, in, in these coming days, just because, you know, according to our Verizon report, 94% of threats are coming through email. So having a detection response on the email is also key because you want to have a visibility of how, is, how the threat is propagated, came from email, and how is that threat moving across your network. So um, I just want to leave with that, and finally, um, I did say that there's a resource tab available, so please feel free to uh, have a look at uh, Especially, I want to point out the Gartner 2020 Market Guide for Cloud Production Platforms. So Gartner came up with uh, evaluation criteria for organizations that are migrating to public cloud or organizations that want to enhance their existing security profile. So I'm proud to say that Trend Micro fits seven of seven recommendations. And also Gartner did, um, did mention in their report suggesting that uh, for anything on your hybrid cloud environment, customers need to look at a dedicated server security solution. When I did say back in 2009, uh, Trend Micro was the first security vendor to come with a uh, automation on VM-based platforms. So that we had this um, uh, futuristic view of cloud and uh, automating either your solutions across your uh, virtual fleet and automation is the key that you heard from all the speakers today across your public cloud. So that actually reflects back on another white paper that's also available for you to review and download. This is a recent IDC uh, market prediction on hybrid cloud security. Trend Micro is a proud where we had close to 30% market share. And also that also reflect, reflects back in uh, Forrester Wave as well. So um, the reason why um, customers need to have a more of a server-centric solutions as typically an endpoint technology that covers your workstations and desktops will focus on endpoint-centric uh, threats. The applications that you run on your servers are far too different to the, uh, to the applications that you run on your endpoints. And also uh, with the automation in that's the topic for today is, uh, is always key. So that's the technology that we offer on your public cloud or hybrid cloud platform is all automated through APIs. So with that, uh, this information is all available for you in the resales widget, so please feel free to download. And um, finally, want to also point out that, you know, for the feedback forms is critical for us to improve and as well as the survey. I did say that um, for folks that are filling our survey links, we'll get an, uh, the surprise winner would get an Apple Airport. So I would encourage you to please uh, fill out the forms. With that, I really thank you for your time and patience. And uh, until next time, have a good day. Cheers.